I can hear you. Okay, there you go. There. We can hear you now. All right. So, uh, yes, sir. So, going back to the businesses and the aid being given to them by the, uh, uh, the state, uh, can you tell us more about this? Well, largely the aid has come from the federal government. So, we've had a number of stimulus packages that have been passed by Congress in the, in the U.S. Senate and signed by the governor, which has provided aid to our businesses, large and small, our, our employees, um, and independent contractors and um, uh, business owners. Everyone's touched in some way by COVID-19. Everyone's hurt in some way. And so a lot of relief has come from the federal government. The federal government has a unique ability in uh, the United States to uh, do things that the states cannot do. It can, it can, what's called deficit spend. It can um, uh, print money, mm -hmm. and we can't do that in, in the states. We need to pass a, a balanced budget every year, and so the state has been providing additional support, trying to fill the gaps when the federal government, uh, when their support has missed some of our people, or we need to provide additional support, including, for example, our, our undocumented California community. Uh -huh. um, the federal government stimulus, pack, stimulus package does not include and support them. And so oh. the state of California created a $125 million fund in, in that oh. case to support our undocumented Californians. Oh, that's great. Uh, so should businesses now be, will be opening soon. So uh, what guidelines would they have to follow to ensure that the uh, virus will not spread again? Well, a lot of the businesses that are opening are are opening in a modified way. And mm -hmm. so physical distancing uh, needs to be observed. Curbside uh, pickup um, is another way. Delivery, in, in, instead of being inside the stores, congregating, touching, shoulder to shoulder, side by side. So uh, we don't have a vaccine. And, and until we have a vaccine, we need to um, really honor and observe many of these practices that have helped us uh, flatten the curve, meaning um, really uh, avoid that surge of, of Californians who need to go in, into our healthcare system and into our hospitals. And we're going to have to continue to do that for the for the near future. Mm -hmm. if, if if we have restaurants that open up for in in room dining, mm -hmm. it'll have to be in a way that has six feet of separation. Mm -hmm. uh, it might look a lot different with with menus that are. Um, discardable, you know, single use only with a server who might be wearing uh, a protective mask or gloves. You might even have your temperature tested before you come in as a, as a, as a customer. And so it, it could look very different. And uh, we have to get used to the new uh, normal because public safety and science and data and evidence should be driving our decisions. Mm -hmm. and, and it is. Mm -hmm. With this new normal, sir, uh, do you think public complacency is going to be a problem? I believe it will be if there isn't a uh, clear cautionary message uh, for the uh, residents. It can, it can be. Uh, it hasn't been so far. So far we've had 40 million Californians who have shown strict adherence and discipline with some minor exceptions, but I, I don't like to talk about the exceptions. I like to talk about what the absolute super majority of Californians have been doing. They've been doing what they've been asked. Mm -hmm. It hasn't been easy. Some people have lost their, their jobs, their livelihoods in the process. Mm -hmm. um, others are you know, facing mental health challenges, being in, in quarantine and, and being in isolation, yes. um, sheltering in place. So there, it's not without its cost. You know, what is good for public health uh -huh. is not, has not always been good during this crisis for um, the economy. And that's been what's been uh, one part of it that's been very difficult. So um, there could be, there, there could be people getting stir crazy, <laughs> um, you know, getting really anxious, <laughs> wanting to get outside, wanting to go back to normal, uh, yes. wanting to get back to work. There's economic pressures for sure, mm -hmm. where folks, you know, need, they need a paycheck. They need to get the, the it gets work again. Mm -hmm. So those are all the pressures that, that could lead to people not strictly following the guidelines that we need to for public health. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about m mental health. Uh, uh, what about our frontliners? There are many Filipino nurses as well, but uh, yeah, mental health uh, of the frontliners. I heard of some cases where frontliners get depressed because they had to decide on uh, triage cases, for example, whether an old person or an immunocompromised young person will get to use a ventilator. How are we, how are we helping our uh, frontliners? 
Well, I'll, first I'll just express my deepest appreciation for our frontline workers, mm -hmm. making sure that, you know, going to work every day, putting themselves in harm's way, at risk, um, facing the, you know, the, the traumas that they see and, and the, the, the emotional challenges that they face every day so that we can be safe, we can be healthy, we can have uh, the food that, that we eat, we can have the health care that we need, mm -hmm. uh, we can be safe. So I want to really appreciate them. And, you know, they're, they're facing a, a lot. And uh, I, this has been a, a time where we've had a lot of collective support for our frontline workers. A lot of attention is rightfully on them and the critical work that they do. They, the, the, you know, people see them as I do, as, as heroes. You know, this, the phrase has been said, said often, you know, not all heroes wear capes. Mm -hmm. They wear masks, and they wear gloves, and they wear, you know, shields and gowns. And they're, they're the ones that are providing that support for us on the front lines every day. And certainly being on the front lines, there's all sorts of, of challenges um, mentally uh, and emotionally. Uh, a lot of the workers feel that they don't want to go home to their families at night because they don't want to expose their families to whatever they may have been exposed to. They want to keep their families safe, so they sleep in their cars or they sleep away uh, from them in, in, ho in hotels. Um, some see things that are, that are um, just emotionally incredibly draining and trying. They see people die. They see people sick. They see people die alone because families can't um, be with them mm -hmm. uh, because of the, the potential spread. Uh, they, so it's very challenging. Um, on, on the issue of that sort of that Hobbesian choice of who deciding who can live and who can die, who gets a ventilator, who doesn't, as far as, as, as I'm aware, that has not happened in California. We, we were able to really stock up and identify uh, ventilators as well as other equipment that we needed, the personal protective equipment, the, mm -hmm. the beds that we needed to be able to prepare for a surge, the healthcare workers to support those beds. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have, we were able to actually send ventilators to states that needed them more than we did. Mm -hmm. uh, we sent them to New York and we sent them to other states mm -hmm. uh, to assist, to, uh, to Illinois, I believe, with another location, New Jersey. And so we were in a position to do that, very pleased and proud of our state that we were in that position. Mm -hmm. And so those decisions, while our, uh, the one you described around ventilators, mm -hmm may well be occurring for some healthcare workers, mm -hmm. for the frontline workers here in California. I'm not aware of that happening. Mm -hmm. But they're going through a lot. They deserve hazard pay. They deserve um, testing and personal protective equipment to do their jobs. They need to be safe um, and, and, um, and prepared and protected. And so there's, there's a lot of, that we have been working on and need to continue to work on to make sure that our frontline workers are appreciated, for sure, but also protected and treated the way they deserve. Mm -hmm. You're also California's first Phil M. Assemblyman. Uh, I'd like to ask, uh, yeah. how are the Phil M. youth coping there in California? This must be something new to them. Yeah, uh, well, yeah, I'm, f I'm proud to be the first Filipino-American state legislator mm -hmm. in the history of California. I was born in Quezon City in St. Luke's Hospital. My mom's from Dumaguete. Oh! And so, <laughs> <laughs> and she came she came from the Philippines to the United States when she was 28 years old for a graduate school program. And um, I am the first. Filipinos are the largest Asian American group in the state of California, fastest growing, by the way. Yes. And in 2012, I became the first Filipino American elected. Very proud of that, very honored, and I'll take it very seriously my obligation and um, my duty to the Filipino American community to represent them to the best of my ability. And youth, Filipino-American youth, and, and I think many youth are having a very difficult time right now. Um, I have three kids. One of my, my oldest is in college. My, my middle is in, in high school. She's a freshman. And then my son is 10. And schools are not operating on school sites right now. School, school is open. Education is, is going. But it's, from, it's through distance learning, virtual learning, online learning. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very different. The students don't go to school. They don't have all the social components that they have uh, normally interacting with their friends and uh, at school. So they're learning from home. It's a more isolated experience. Mm -hmm. And a lot of, there's a lot of anxiety and, and mental health issues. There's um, friends who, who miss each other and, and need that support, mm -hmm. uh, that social support to um, you know, stay emotionally healthy. Mm -hmm. And they're not getting it. So it, it's, it's very difficult right now. I think the good thing is there was a time when we were going deeper and deeper into um, you know, what seemed like a potential abyss uh, that was, no one knew where it would end. We didn't know what would happen. We had projections on what was possible and what the surge could look like on how many could become ill, how many could die. Mm -hmm. And those were very 
um, alarming mm. uh, and, and anxiety um, uh, causing numbers. Mm -hmm. And we, we are now, I believe, past the worst. We're, we're, we're talking about um, loosening the restrictions, not tightening them. We're talking, we're, we're, the data that's coming in shows less deaths uh, each day from COVID and we're uh, on the way, on the road to recovery. So some of the worst is behind us, I believe, but we're still in the middle of an international pandemic. And, we, and if we don't handle this right, if we don't make decisions based on data and science and what's best for public health and yeah. facts, then uh, we could, this could come back at any time. And again, we do not have a vaccine. We don't have a cure. Mm -hmm. um, and so we need to make sure we're, 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 we're making safe, healthy choices. Mm -hmm. um there have been instances of racial discrimination reported elsewhere of uh, Filipinos due to the COVID-19 situation. Were there any uh, situations like this over there in California? There have been. It's been a very sad aspect of the COVID-19 crisis, which is inherently very sad and very tragic. And that has been the, the anti Asian Pacific Islander and anti, including anti-Filipino mm -hmm. hate, uh, acts of hate because um, in, in my view, there have been irresponsible statements made about COVID-19, the, the coronavirus. It's been called the Chinese virus by President Trump. It's been called the Wuhan virus. It's been referred to uh, in circles in the White House as Kung flu and very insensitive, very xenophobic. Mm -hmm. uh, very inappropriate, very unnecessary, and it's led to real harm to real people. Mm -hmm. People have been attacked, they've been spit on, they've been yelled at, they've been cursed at. Um, people who, many of whom are, are frontline workers. Um, so after doing their heroic job, uh, fighting for us, keeping us safe, um, they get spit on or beat up because uh, they're viewed to be part of some monolithic Asian American group that is um, allegedly responsible somehow uh, for, for their bringing um, for, for, for the uh, COVID-19, for the coronavirus. So um, I'm part of the Asian Pacific Islander Legislative Caucus, the, the, the legisl Asian American legislative members in California. This is an issue that's very near and dear to us, very important to us. We've been working to get more and more of the incidents reported. And we have a hotline that we've been working um, on, on having a, available and open. And, and there were uh, very sadly um, hundreds and, and um, you know over thousands of reports of incidents of hate. And mm -hmm. so we're trying to get the word out to make sure people understand uh, that this is a, a virus that it, it knows no race, knows no boundary, um, and that it is very much inappropriate and wrong to be assigning blame and acting with hate and, and harm and violence against Asian Americans, including Filipino Americans. Mm -hmm. So we, 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 we are making progress. Uh, we are getting the word out. Uh, but there's been people hurt already and, and you know, one person uh, being attacked um, on an incident of hate based on the COVID-19 is wrong and shouldn't be happening at all. So we're going we're gonna to keep fighting to make sure that we uh, re reduce and eliminate those acts of hate. Mm -hmm. uh, sir, before I let you go, I'd like uh, uh, to get a, a message from you to everyone watching you right now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, my message is these are difficult times. They're unprecedented times. They're times that we've never had before. We haven't faced them as a, a state uh, here in California as a, 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 a just anything uniquely like this as a, as a United States or even internationally. And so it's something where um, we need to remember that we are no strangers to adversity and we're no strangers to overcoming adversity and we've come together as a state we've come together as a nation we've come together as an international community we're still on the path to defeating this virus in the form of a vaccine but we've made great progress with testing and contract tracing and flattening the curve and physical distancing and we need to keep following data and science and evidence and public health guidelines that's how we're going to stay safe that's how we're going to beat this virus and at this time i think throughout this world um, this, this conversation is an example of it. We're, we're all so interconnected, um, more than I, I think we even knew before that we're part of that, um, that network of, of mutuality uh, with a shared fate, um, uh, interconnectedness where the things that I do and things that you do uh, affect one another, affect others. Our actions impact those around us. 
And so we need to always be aware of the us um, and the we instead of the me. So uh, hang in there, take care of one another, look after each other. We will get through this. We'll get through it together and um, by following science and, and data and public health guidelines. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for your time. Much appreciated. Stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you. You as well. Thanks for having me.